Open your Bibles, if you would, to, uh, let's go to, let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. I heard a story recently of a, of a man who, uh, he had pain all over his body. You ever had pain? It just felt like it was everywhere, especially after a workout or something. But this was literally like every part of his body was hurting. So he decided to go to the doctor and get it checked out. Of course, when a doctor diagnoses, you know, when you say you have something, immediately start thinking about what it is. So the doctor asked him, are you sure it's, you know, every part of your body? And he's absolutely, anywhere I touch, it hurts. And so he said, well, okay, what I want you to do is touch your knee and you tell me if it hurts. He touches his knee and, oh, my gosh, you know, oh, yes, so much pain. He touches, he says, well, touch, you know, your forehead. We'll see if that hurts. Oh, oh, my gosh, yes, it's just so painful. Well, touch your, touch your elbow. Oh, oh, it's just so tender. And so he's thinking for a minute, and he says, let me see your finger. And he looks at his finger, and his finger is dislocated. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't pull it off as well as Steve, you know. <laughs> but, but obviously, you know, <laughs> there was one thing that was wrong with him, but it felt like that it, it hurt everywhere. Isn't it amazing sometimes how life is like that? There can be one thing that's wrong, one thing wrong in your life, and it affects everything. You ever been in a bad relationship? Don't raise your hand. You ever, amen, some of you are honest, God bless you. You ever been in a position where your, you know, your finances were in terrible shape or you had sickness in your body? Doesn't it affect everything? You have bad days at work. Uh, everybody around you seems bitter and hurtful. It, it really does. It can seem like when there's one thing wrong in your life, it can affect everything. But the reality is, if you fix that one thing, if you fix this, it fixes everything. So when it comes to our walk with God and our purpose, and this is what I want to talk about today, is, is destiny and purpose. That's what we're going to kind of go towards. And it does tie right into uh, what Pastor Dave's been uh, teaching on with vision uh, this particularly lovers of the word, the word of God will take you to a place and a destination you want to go. Without it, you can just be kind of floating through life. I used this example this morning, and I want to clarify again um, when it comes to culture. I love uh, Dean Randy's teaching on culture and, and how it's affected us and how the church should be affecting it and all that interplay. It's amazing because we live in this world. We're not of the world, but we live in this world. And you, God made you fearfully and wonderfully. He didn't make a mistake when he made you. I, you know, and I said this earlier this morning too, that especially with women, there's such a, a stigma and a stereotype that ladies have to live with, and men too to a certain degree, but especially women, because God designed every one of you. And listen, I'm not saying this for brownie points. I really believe this, because I'm a dad of daughters. I have three girls. I'm married. So I've been around some women, and I figured out that I, I don't know anything, basically, <laughs> number one. So I don't claim to know anything. But even with culture, I, one of my examples was, I use right now is all the racial tension and the police thing going on in our country right now. It's still, uh, we're still seeing it just blow up around the country. And everybody's got a different opinion on that. But here's what I can't do. I can't transport myself into, into a, a black man's skin and claim to understand that whole dynamic. I can observe from afar, and I might have an opinion on it, but unless you've really walked a mile in that skin, it's hard for you to understand it. But here's the other truth with that. The other truth is God trumps culture, but he doesn't deny culture. We see many instances in the Word of God where culture should be celebrated, there's nothing wrong with celebrating where you're from, but the word of God always overrides any ideology. It has to. As believers, this is where we get into trouble. When we allow our ideologies to trump God's word, the nation is a mess. And that's what's happened. As much as your culture means to you, the word of God has to be first and foremost if you call yourself a believer. That doesn't deny your skin color, where you're from, how you were raised, what region of the world you're from. All those things are where God placed you. It was his plan to do that. He did not make a mistake when he made you like you are. You're fearfully and wonderfully made. But the word of God has to come first. And if we get back to the place where we're exalting the word of God in society, culture will change. And so that's basically the message. God bless you. I'll see you next week. No, <laughs> But it's true, you know, and so 
when we, when we lose our identity, and this is what I was going to say about, about black culture that I can observe even though I haven't been there, everybody would probably agree that one of the problems is a fatherless generation. Without a father in the home, it doesn't matter what color your skin is, you're going to have hopelessness in someone who has no identity as a man, and they're going to lash out in ways that they just don't, they don't know what to do. There's not a man in the house training them to be an honorable man of God. And we tend to stereotype everything as a society anyway. Don't watch the news. You'll think the world's going to hell. God has a plan for our country. He has a plan for this world. It's not as bad as the media makes it out. Is it a problem? Yes. In a, in a way, is the media a good thing because they shine a light on a situation that needs change? Yes. Absolutely. But the fact is, if you look at society in general for the past 2,000 years, we're in a much better time than we've ever been. We have more information. We have more anointing, more of the word of God, more churches around the world. We still have work to do. But if you start doing comparisons on how bad things are going to be in the past in some other countries, trust me, we're in a pretty good place in the United States. So we need to, as believers, do our job. And we can't do our job unless we understand this message of purpose and destiny. It, it, you, listen, you don't have a choice God has created every human being with a destiny on the inside. And a destiny, all it is, is a destination. We kind of over-spiritualize it sometimes. But it's just where you need to get to in your life. And, you know, there's different teachings on it. There's some with predestination that say that your lot in life is, you know, whatever it is, and it's cast. It's not true. The mind warp is that God already knows the end from the beginning, yet you can change that end. You, you know, you can't even wrap your mind around that. What an amazing thing that God knows the end from the beginning, yet you can't affect your destiny and be different. Amen? I, I shared before that I've done ancestry research in the last couple of years, and I was blown away by some of the stuff I found out and actually found my family history back, uh, you know, a, a good thousand years and was able to trace it. It was incredible. But I found out I had one preacher in my family, and this was my fourth great-grandfather, he was an anti-missionary Baptist preacher. He established one of the first churches west of the Mississippi, a Baptist church in Texas. And he was a circuit rider. And you know, circuit riders were, you got to do the horse thing if you're going to talk about circuit riding because you got to get on the horse. You know? But he, he rode horses from community to community and, and preached the gospel and tried to plant churches there. Well, Calvinism teaches that we all are predestined, some to heaven, some to hell. It's basically... And an anti-missionary Baptist is so extreme in their Calvinism that they say that why even go out and win the lost? They're going to hell anyway. Why even evangelize? What a doomsday version of Christianity to believe, man. Like, my gosh, just, you know, well, they're going to hell. Forget it. You're going to hell, buddy. See ya, you know. So, you know, when we have uh, our purpose wrapped up in our identity, and this is what I want to get to, understanding the difference between these two things. Culture may be something that's part of your identity, but it can't really identify you completely. Because first and foremost, we identify with Christ. We talk about identity a lot in this church, but it's important to understand the difference between the two things. Identity and destiny aren't the same thing. For instance, if uh, I wrapped up my identity in just being in the ministry, then I may be a bad father because I there's pastors whose kids have just, you know, gone to hell because they didn't care and the ministry was everything to them. I could be just as happy and just as fulfilled wrenching on cars as I could doing what I'm doing right now. But I'm fulfilling my purpose. If you would have asked me 20 years ago, would I be standing in Reno, Nevada in front of people, you know, sharing the word of God? I would have said no. There's no way I would have believed that. Yet here I am because I, I learned when I first got born again that I needed to find my purpose and fulfill my destiny. And this is, I, I'm not there. I'm still heading towards my destination, but I am in my purpose at the moment. I, I said this before, I can say it without a doubt, that I 100% right now know that I'm in the middle of God's will for my life. And you can know that. You can absolutely know that. God gave you the ability to know if you're in his will. Part of the problem is understanding God's will. And that's one of the things I want to share with you in Romans 12 too. Bob, you can put it up on the board. You don't have to turn there. I just want to break it down for you. It says this, do not be conformed to this world. And that's the first clue. We don't conform ourselves to the world, the world system, the world's ideology, and the way the world thinks. We conform ourselves to who? Jesus. Amen. He's, he's our example. 
but be transformed. And that's a whole message in itself, conformity versus transformation. We could go there for weeks. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Change the way you think. Don't let the world program, and it program you and tell you that this is acceptable. We were talking earlier about ladies and, you know, the, the issues you have to deal with. I, I'm a people watcher. I love just watching people. I go into the mall or I'm in a restaurant, and uh, sometimes I feel a little bad. I, if somebody catches me staring at them, I'm like, oh, hey, you know what I'm saying? You know? <laughs> but one of the things I really noticed that I'm re- very curious about is women because, again, men can say we understand our wives, but we really don't. So, but I like to pay attention and try to understand, right? And so I watch my wife sometimes, and I watch you ladies. And what I watch is not so much you, but I watch how you watch other women. (laughs) I'm, I'm being nice. But, you know, listen, again, you're fearfully and wonderfully made. God did not make a mistake. You guys are just way more complicated than us. And that's not a bad thing. That's actually a compliment. Uh, you know, if, if a man says they can multitask, they're probably lying. Right. <laughs> I'm very single-minded. You can ask my wife, I'm hungry, I just want food, I don't want to talk, I just, let's, let's do this. If I start doing something, I almost don't even want to communicate, and it gets old, worse the older I get. Like, I just want to, let's just do this, and then we can deal with everything else. And women can juggle 12 things at once and just be okay with it, you know. And so God made you that way, it's okay. But one of the things that society has programmed you to do, and I really believe this, is the, and Pastor Dave's preached this before too, you know, the sin of comparisonitis, <clears throat> how we compare ourselves to everything and especially women. But why? Because society has told you to do that. So here's what happens. I'm going to pretend I'm my wife for a minute. So I'm much prettier right now. But, but like a woman, and I'm not saying this is her alone. This is, I've watched you ladies do this. A woman walks into the room, and Lisa, since I used you as my guinea pig this morning, can I do it again? She was my helper this morning. A woman walks in the room, and here's what happens with her eyes immediately. A guy's like, you know, we just all we try to do is avert our eyes because, you know, we're very visual guys, and we, we're going to be good and not look at things we shouldn't, right? You know, but it, so you know what I'm saying? We're men. We understand that. But here's how a guy, when a lady walks in the room, is like, oh, how you doing? But when a lady walks in the room, here's what they do. <laughs> Shoes, hair outfit and immediately make about a dozen judgments. I'm not saying bad judgments. You may love her shoes and her hair, but immediately there's like a thousand things going on in your mind. And what automatically happens most of the time, if you really don't know your identity in Christ, you immediately start comparing yourself to her. Is that, am I telling the truth, ladies? Is that, does that happen? Now, again, based on your identity and who Jesus is, you get a hold of that. We men have our own issues, But unfortunately, when we compare, what we're doing is calling into question what God did in you and the way God made you. And the reality is, again, you are fearfully and wonderfully made. He did not make a mistake when he made you. He didn't make a mistake in the family that he put you in. Does that mean that everybody comes from a great family and it's all good? Nope, we have issues. I come from a bad family as far as history. There's some things that I dealt with as a child that were really bad. But you are unique in that God has put you in a position in your life right now to make a difference, and to get to a destination where you can fulfill your purpose. Amen? Let me give you an example of someone in, of, of who maybe you wouldn't look at as somebody who's you know, really highly esteemed, and, and you might even think yourself like, well, what can I do? I'm one person. I haven't really done much in my life. I don't come from very much. And, and the only reason you say that is because you compare your life to someone else's. That's the only reason you say that. If not, you would take God at his word and say, what can I do? God, I don't know what I can do, but with through you, I can do anything. What can I do to make a difference in the world that I'm in? Amen? Billy Graham, who, who knows that name? Almost everybody. If you know, I mean, it's like saying Michael Jackson. I mean, you know, everybody knows. You know what I'm saying? If you haven't heard of Billy Graham, you probably haven't been around very much. But Billy Graham, one of the greatest evangelists of our time, no matter how you feel about him, friend of presidents, have, has changed the face of the world and the ministry that God called him to. A simple man. That, that listened to God, obeyed him, and just one of the greatest influencers of all time. Amen? Billy Graham was born again in a Billy, Billy Sunday crusade. Billy Sunday, some of you might recognize that name. It's probably not as famous. But Billy Sunday was a famous evangelist back in the early part of the, 19th, or the 20th century. Did great things for the kingdom. Again, a wonderful evangelist. One of the greatest evangelists of our time. Billy Graham was born again because of Billy Sunday. Billy Sunday 
was born again in a Sunday school class with, a, with an old gentleman who taught Sunday school for 30 years, faithfully, was there every Sunday and taught Sunday school. And Billy Sunday became a believer in that Sunday school class with this old gentleman. Now, think about it. Here's an old gentleman who probably never knew this story playing out. All he knew was, I'm going to be a faithful Sunday school teacher. I'm going to put into, you know, Jesus into these kids and show them the right way. And out of that, Billy Sunday's born again. And out of that, Billy Graham's born again. And the world has changed because of a faithful Sunday school teacher. You, you can't limit your thinking when it comes to what God has called you to do, thinking that you can't make a difference. Because you don't see the ripple effect of that rock going into the pond when it spreads out and it starts to affect everything around you. That is a principle in the word of God that he's just a multiplier and he'll take the little bit that you have and make it something great. So don't limit yourself based on your past experience. We're going to talk about that a little bit. Things that's happened to you or you thinking you can't do anything because God has put greatness on the inside of you and his name is Jesus. Amen. You just need to ask yourself, okay, if I know that I'm called, I'm supposed to do something, then what is that? That's your purpose, but you can't base your identity in it. Your identity is based in who Jesus is. You still go to heaven and not do a thing, and you'll be rewarded according to the works you did on the earth, but God has put something on the inside of you that when you get to that destination and you get to heaven, you've heard it before, you know, he's going to say, well done, good and faithful servant, or, well... Come on in. <laughs> Just a joke. God wouldn't do that. But, you know, seriously, you want to know that you're fulfilling what God has called you to do. Amen. Everybody can do something. It might be business. You know, the reality is not everybody's going to have a ministry. Now, most people in this room will never have a pulpit ministry, but you can do something. There are people who are just anointed to make money, man. They are just business-minded and can impact the kingdom by sowing into missions and doing things with the creativity that God's given them. People that come and just be a blessing, and when they're doing building projects, they can lend their expertise. So don't limit to just thinking always, well, I'm going to be a preacher one day, because that's not the reality for everyone. Amen? So knowing the difference, one, destiny is the answer to the question, what has God called me to do? Two, identity is the answer to the question, what has God called me to be? Okay? You can't do one without the other. You need to have your identity established so you can get to your destination, but you can't get to your destination without knowing your identity either. So they, they work together, amen? Knowing one doesn't help if you don't know both of them. All right, that's, that's the first thing. Here's the second thing. We already kind of alluded to it. God has a perfect plan for every human on the earth. Isaiah 46.10, Bob, it says this. Declaring the end from the beginning, we love saying that as faith people, you know. Declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, things which have not been done, saying, my purpose will be established, amen, and I will accomplish all my good pleasure. Pastor Dave's used this example before when it comes to vision. You know, we can't think we're the end all to anything if God has showed you something because he's going to have his will established in the earth. You know, he's used the example of even projects before. I don't remember if it was the one he was talking about when we did the billboard projects, the campaign. I believe it was that one he said the Spirit of God spoke to him and said, you know, I actually had asked someone else to do this and they didn't do it. So now I'm asking you. So God will have his will established in the earth. And, but here's the thing. It's not that he's disappointed in you because you didn't do it. He's going to get it done. But why not you? Why not you? If he spoke to you originally, why not be the one that's going to fulfill what he called you to do? And every word that God gives, he gives you all the ability, all the finances, the vision, everything to get it done. So when it comes to direction, your choices determine not just the direction of your life, but the character of your life. You know, it, so, much, so many times in ministry, most people focus on the fruit of, of all the things that go on on the outside. Like, I, I would pray this morning that you would not judge me by what I'm sharing with you this morning, but you would judge my, the character of my life, what I'm like when I'm not here, what I'm like when I'm with... See, every time I talk about my family, I can't help it. What I'm like with when, when I'm with my family. What I like when I'm interacting with you on a personal basis as, as fellow believers. I, I'd rather my life be judged by that rather than what I'm sharing with you right now. And it's so opposite sometimes where uh, the whole, whole ministry is judged by what goes on on the, on, the, on the front lines. 
But really, character is the key issue. And that's one of the things that's great about the school. One of our foundational principles is character. I don't have it all figured out. I'm a man who makes mistakes. But I'm telling you that anyone who knows me personally, and I can say this about myself because, I, I listen, there's people who know me personally. And I can confidently say that I don't change much. What you have standing before you today is pretty much the same guy that would be around you out in a fishing hole somewhere or working on a motorcycle or whatever. I, I, I understand that principle of I don't have it all together, but my character means everything to me. So that is something that's foundational to every choice you have to make. And I said all that to say this. So many put people focus on the journey and the road and getting it done that they forget that that's the foundation of everything and it comes first. The direction of your life will not just determine your character, but it'll prove it out. Because there's many people who start right, but they don't end well. Amen? And I want to be the guy that, you know, hits the gates of heaven and God says, well done, good and faithful servant. Not just good servant. You notice he says good and faithful servant because he's always looking for faithful men and women of God. Amen? So let that be the foundation of your choices. Know that, it, you know, a lack of character doesn't rule you out because we see that all the time. You know, ministries, pastors fail. And thank God for mercy that they can be restored. And, you know, sometimes, unfortunately, as a body of Christ, we like to kick people when they're down and, you know, beat them down a little more when they've fallen. And the mercy of God should pick them and help them up and restore them. But character matters more than anything. I would rather receive from a man who has good character and maybe not as flashy or of a delivery than someone who has no character and can really just work a crowd, you know? Amen. I want to hear from a man who it's coming out of his heart of something that he's lived and proven, and he's got a foundation of having the godlike character in his life over everything. Amen. That's why I can receive from my pastor so well. So I can say that when he's not here. I can brag on him because he wouldn't really say it about himself. But the thing that I love more than anything about my pastor, we're talking about Pastor Dave, is that he's a man of character. He, he means what he says. He lives a life that's separated under God. He's a man of prayer in the word. And that means everything to me. I can follow a man like that. And I have for over 20 years. That's why that I've maintained and stayed here. It's not so much because, man, I just love Faith Alive, which I do. And I love you, which I do. But it's because I can follow a man that has character in his life. Amen? And follow him to the end. And so don't tell me that it's not important. So, again, these are just adjustments you might need to make. You think, well, I've tried and things have failed. Check, make that one of the checkups. How's my character? What does it look like? Am I really emulating Jesus in my life? Am I living like he lived? There's going to be areas you're going to find that you can improve on. Man, of course. You know, we don't have it all figured out, but that's where grace comes in. Thank God for the grace of God who covers all those things and mercy that's there waiting for you every morning. But making adjustments on the fly is smart, you know, because then you can get to your destination. Imagine, you know, you think about the moonshot that they did, the first one. I think it was in 69, right? So here I was born. The moonshot, if they would have been off, and some of you scientific types may know this a little better, but if they would have been off by one degree, they would have been in Mars, you know, or the other side of the galaxy. So there, was, there were constant adjustments that computer had to make the entire time and a certain window that, that that rocket had to fly through for them to get to the moon and make it. And, and, you know, there's still people to this day that don't believe we went to the moon. The moon conspiracy people were like, no, no, it was in a movie studio. It's like, seriously, like, I, you know, I think conspiracy theories are fun, but come on, man. No, they didn't go to the moon. That was a studio. You see that shadow? It's three degrees off. Whatever. You know, I believe they went to the moon, but I'm, I'm not a super conspiracy theorist. They're a little bit in me. Pastor Dave, complete conspiracy theorist. If he's watching right now, he knows. Yeah, I wouldn't say it. I'd say it in front of his face, too. Amen. So character is something that's really important. Choices determine the character, direction, destiny uh, of our life. Amen. I'm going to read a couple of scriptures to you. Proverbs 28, 26 says, He who trusts in himself is a fool, but he who walks in wisdom is kept safe. <laughs> you know, it's, to me, this is another one of those scriptures that's a definition of an atheist. You know, because atheists don't have really anybody else to trust in but themselves. And so, if I, how many of you, have you ever had your heart lead you astray? Come on, man, you can't even trust your own heart. But even if our heart condemns us, there's one who's greater than our heart. Thank God for that. But our heart can lead us some places we don't want to go. So we can't even trust that. To trust in even that, we're foolish. That's why we have to put our trust in God. Amen? He's always going to lead us into in, in the green pastures. He's going to lead us into the right place. Psalm 139, 16. Now, I think this is going to be the new King James that pops up, but 
Uh, I love this translation. It says, your eyes saw me when I was only a fetus. <laughs> it says, your eyes saw my substance uh, being yet unformed. He's talking about the baby in the womb. But I just love that it says, when I was a fetus. Every day of my life was recorded in your book before one of them had taken place. Isn't that amazing? The story of your life really has been written already. And, and I'll say this, God knows it and it can be adjusted. You can make choices right now that will affect your destiny, but God has a perfect plan for you and he can be trusted because he knows you like no one else. There, you know, we've used this example many times of people that feel like they're, you know, they don't want to ask God to what they want to do in life because they're afraid he's going to call them to Africa or Asia or something. If that's not in your heart, God is not going to call you on the mission field. Like, don't you, he puts those passions on the inside of you. If there's something you're passionate about, most likely God put it on the inside. The, the, the thing to do is to develop that passion. We're talking about good things, you know. I, we can be black and white in certain areas. You know, this is one of them that we're talking about good things. But, you know, what is it saying about if you find something you love to do, you'll never work another day in your life, you know, making money at it? So, again, it could be something that's business related. But don't limit it to that because it may not be business. I know people that their entire identity is wrapped up in their job. And that's all they live and breathe. Now, if that's what they're supposed to be doing, there's a lot in life. I don't know that. That's between them and God. But challenge, ask yourself, God, am I on the path you've set me on? Is this what I'm supposed to be doing? See, knowing God's will, and I, I skipped over it. We need to go back to it. Romans 12, 2. Put that back up there, Bob. Because I forgot to mention it. We were going to talk about the will of God. Romans 12, 2. It says this. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that, what is it? Good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. Now, we have talk about that quite a bit. We've used that terminology in talking about the three wills of God. But here's, I want to break it down a little bit farther to you. Um, God's good will is this. Every one of those are good things. Every one of those are good. There's not one of those that are, that are bad. But there's levels of importance when it comes to what he's saying in this particular passage. Here's the first one. The good will of God is, it's, it literally means, the word good there means useful. It's just things that are useful. Those are decisions you might make. And it's not necessarily something that's spirit-led, like, God, should I have this hamburger or that hamburger? Just eat the hamburger. God cares, but, you, you know, he may have an opinion. Well, I'll maybe eat that one, you know. It's not like God's going to say, thus saith the Lord, have the Big Mac. <laughs> thus saith me, I guess, you know. But uh, I don't know why we're talking about Big Macs. Those are uh, so unhealthy, Brother Andy. We just need to stay away, right? So, but the point is the useful will is something that just will be useful for your life, but it's not necessarily something that's spirit-led. And it's probably not something that's spirit-led. It can be useful to you, but God gave you a will. He gave you a mind, and it's okay if you make some decisions. You don't have to over-spiritualize everything. God, there's just some decisions you're going to make. They're going to be beneficial and useful, but it's not necessarily something that's God-inspired, okay? Here's the second one, acceptable will. What's that? It's something that's well-pleasing. It means well-pleasing when you see acceptable in that passage. What does that mean? Again, it's not necessarily something that's God-inspired. It might be. He gives you a prompting to do something or sow something or talk to someone. And, you know, it's like if, if, you have a, if you're a parent, you understand this. If your child does something that you're proud of, that's very well-pleasing to you. What do you do? You go tell everybody. Call your mom on the phone. You let their, you know, their, their friends know. Your friends come over and you talk and brag on your kid. That's a godly thing. God loves it. He's so well-pleased when we make good choices in life. It may be something that is spirit-led, but not necessarily. You have just, you maybe just made the good choice, and God is well-pleased in that situation. So that's that particular part of his will. Now, the one that's critical, it's no really less important than the others. Maybe, I guess you could say it's more important. The perfect will of God means this. This is the definition. Brought to its end or finished. This is where you better hope you've got God involved. Because to, to be brought to the end of God's will and be finished means that you need him to lead you to that place. This is a place that he's reserved for you and you can trust him that he's taking you the right way because he's got your best interest like no one else in your life at heart. He knows you like no one else. 
He knows what's going to fulfill you and make you happy so he can be completely trusted with you putting your life in his hands. And when you do that, you get to the end of the destination of your life and not only are you happy, but he's happy and that's God's perfect will. Those are the kind of things you need to think about when it comes to not just the general direction of your life, but the destination, the destiny of your life. That has to be completely in God's hands and ask him, Lord, what be thy will according to this that I readeth? You can use the King James, you know, if you want. Throw some King James on it, sprinkle it up a little bit. You know, it sounds real good, you know. But you, you better know, amen? And you can know. He's going to show you the right way. So that's the second thing. Third thing is this. We talked about comparisons, you know, and how uh, wrong they are. But here's what comparisons do. Comparisons bring you to a halt in your journey. They stop you. Because as soon as you compare yourself to someone else, you feel less than. Or you can feel greater than, and then you're in pride. So they're not healthy at all. The best comparison always is the mirror of the word of God. As a matter of fact, what is my favorite definition of grace is uh, it's the divine influence upon the heart and its reflection in the life. So God divinely influences you. We know unmerited favor is a great one, but look it up in the Thayers. This is one of the definitions. The divine influence upon the heart, God divinely influences you. It's reflected in your life, and people see the character of Jesus. That's why when, you know, they say, if you've just met them or spent some time around them, I just, I don't know what it is about you, man, but I like you. Why are you so happy all the time? It's not really about you. They're seeing the character of Jesus. They're seeing God's reflection in your life. They're seeing grace on you. That is the exact definition of grace. God divinely influences you and people see grace on you. And it's like a mirror. But this is the only thing we should be comparing ourselves to is the word of God. You'll find your identity in here and be much more confident and secure than comparing yourself to anybody else. Amen. But I listen to this statement. I just thought this was so good. It's a little bit complicated, and we can break it down a little simpler. When I say it's complicated, I'm not assuming it's complicated for you. I got stumbled on it. So you know what I'm saying? Purpose is not measured by what you've done compared to what someone else has done. Purpose is not measured by what you've done compared to what someone else has done. That's the first part. Because here's what we do. Let's say when it comes to our influence, okay? And even what I'm doing right now, my favorite preacher is T.D. Jakes. I love Bishop Jakes. I, nobody can tell a story. I don't care who your favorite preacher is. Nobody can tell a story like Bishop Jakes, man. I mean, he can just, just captivate you with his words and wrap you all around him. And I just like, I feel like I'm drooling sometimes listening to him like, where does he get this revelation, man? He just, he's just an amazing preacher. I love him. But if I compared myself, I'm no T.D. Jakes. If I compared myself to him, I'd just quit right now. I don't even want to be up here. Because, I, you know, I mean, I just, I give up. He's the best. But I'm going to stay in my lane. I'm going to be me. I'm going to do what God has called me to do in my sphere of influence. It's like pastors who get caught up in the megachurch thing. Like, I'm not success, successful unless I've got 20,000 people. But thank God for like our ministry, our philosophy is you don't have to be a big church to do big things. God has called us to do some pretty big things sometimes. And we don't have to be a mega church to do that. You just have to be obedient to the purpose and the destination and knowing that we're heading to a place where God said, do this and we're going to get there. So it's not even sometimes necessarily the thing that's at the end of your life. It could be the end of a project. You were successful because you did what God told you to do and you got there and fulfilled your purpose and that's it. As soon as you start to compare to someone else, you feel like a failure. And that's not what God called you to do. So keep the comparison out of it. Amen? You can't compare. Let me say it again. Purpose is not measured by what you've done compared to what someone else has done. But by what you've done compared to what you're supposed to do. That is the true measure of success. When you can compare what you've done so far compared to where you're going and where you're supposed to be, that's where success comes in. Because then you have a destination. You know where you're going. Okay, if i got to get there, I need to do this, this, and this. And if you don't know, you ask God, Lord, what do I need to do to get to that place? But there's a lot of people who are afraid to ask that question. Or there's things that's kept them back from doing it. Making comparisons. Uh, you know, feeling like a failure. Anybody ever failed at anything? Lord Jesus, if I had to, you know, live off, not do anything because of failures, I'd just quit again today. 
But there's so many examples in the Word of God of people that felt like failures. Gideon is a great example. Remember Gideon was hiding in the wine press? You know, he's, he's in there with his, you know, threshing tool. And like, he's afraid somebody's going to steal his wheat. And he's looking out for Midianites coming and he's threshing his wheat because he's afraid somebody's going to come by and take it from him. And an angel calls him a mighty man of valor. You mighty man of valor. He's like, uh, I don't know if you've noticed, but not only am I the least in my family, our tribe is actually the least in this whole community. And you must be talking about somebody else because I ain't no mighty man of valor. Here's the amazing thing about Gideon, though, and this is why it's important to name your children the right thing, too. Gideon's name, uh, it means this. It, it, this was his identity. He didn't see himself that way. But Gideon means cutter down or destroyer. So God did not base his, his picking on his experience, who he was, but he usually calls those foolish things of the world just so he can confound the wise. And so you may have come from a, a bad experience of a family, so did I, I get it, but it doesn't matter. Anything in your past does not determine, or you shouldn't let it determine your future and where God has taken you. It doesn't matter if it's a failure or not. Learn from it, move on, but please, Lord Jesus, keep moving. Keep moving towards your destination, amen? Don't let those things hold you back. Now, obviously, we're all in different levels of that and where we're walking with God and the things that we're doing. You know, there might be people who feel like they've been stuck in a rut, you know, and you know God has called you to something, but it's been 30 years and you're still waiting on the Lord. If it's been 30 years, it's time to go look in the mirror. Can I just say that lovingly? If it's been 30 years and you're just like, well, I'm still waiting on God, you know, for this ministry to take off. If it's been 30 years, it's time to do an evaluation. I'm not saying God always does things quickly, but at some point you got to take some ownership and say, okay, I, you know, I, you can't wait till you're 75. I mean, God's merciful. You could, but you can start moving towards a destination now and doing something. And there's another mistake people make. They wait for something just to fall in their lap and they don't take any steps towards moving to their destiny. Amen. You got to start doing something. Do something. Get active. Do something that's going to cause you to get to that place. Amen. God's right there in the middle of it. I, do you believe that? I do too. Amen. All right. What time is it? 12 o'clock. We're wrapping up right now. Praise the Lord. So I have a video clip I wanted to show you. You guys okay watching about a four minute video? Yeah. It's just, it moves me to tears when I watch it. Uh, I just think it's really good. It has to do with kind of like what I'm talking about. Pay close attention to what this gentleman shares. Uh, how many of you know who Jonathan David Helzer is? He's a worship leader, uh, that whole crop of new generation worship leaders that uh, I don't know that he's out of, I think he's out of Bethel, but my gosh, he's written just some amazing songs and he's a psalmist and uh, his dad uh, was a musician also. And this is his dad sharing the testimony about his life. And if you listen, you'll hear some things about some past mistakes that he made, some challenges along the way that, did, that could have caused them to not have this wonderful man of God who's now writing beautiful songs in the body of Christ. And, and this story gets played out over and over and over again. It's not unique to him, but uh, listen to it, and I think you'll enjoy it. Sorry for the quality. It kind of cuts out a little bit, but I think you'll get the gist of it. So, Every story has a beginning. I don't know where this really begins, except I know in May the 19th, 1970, I came home to Jesus after a rock and roll career and lots of smoking dope and come home to my wife and she forgave me for three and a half years of unfaithfulness and we began to follow Jesus. And it was hard, it was trying, it was beautiful, but in 1976, something happened that wrecked my heart, my life. She had made several trips to the physician, her gynecologist, her female doctor. And he said, Linda, there's some problems. The long and short was she had cancer of the uterus and what was necessary was to have a hysterectomy of surgery to remove all the female organs. And I wasn't so concerned about that because we had two daughters and we had enough and I didn't want any more children anyway because I figured some of the drugs I did, why risk having a child deformed? 
and two weeks before the schedule of hysterectomy, a prophetic man, because back in those days, in the 70s, nobody was known as a prophet. But a very prophetic man called me and said, I need to see you. Something happened that's life-changing. He would go to a baseball field where there was some swings, kind of a playground. And he would go there in the evening and intercede. Retired school teacher, he prayed. He said, last night I was on a baseball field and Jesus just suddenly appeared in front of me. I'd never had that happen before. I was shocked and the Lord said, it's okay, Kermit. But I have a message I want you to tell my servant, Ken Helser. I want you to tell him first, I've healed his seed and I have never told anybody the reason I didn't even want any more children is I was concerned about the drugs I did. And here's a man that I barely had known only one other time saying, Jesus said, I've healed your seed. And you're gonna have a son and his name will be Jonathan David and he will play the harp. He will sing like an angel and he will write prophetic songs for his generation and his music will go out all over the earth. Now, when you're two weeks from his directive, that's, that's dramatic. And I said, God, is this you? And it grew in my heart, and I never knew I wanted a son so badly. And in a short amount of time, my wife and I are praying and telling the gynecologist, can you do one more test? On a Sunday, I anointed her with oil, prayed for her, and it wasn't dramatic. But during that prayer, my wife touched the hem of Jesus' garment. On Friday, with the scheduled hysterectomy on Monday, they did a DNC, and that's when they go in and scrape the wound. The test came back on Saturday, and when the doctor came down the hall whistling, we said, that's a good sign. He stuck his head in the door and said, the pathologist is baffled. He's consulted me three times saying, this is not the same woman. Ken, your wife is 200% okay. We got pregnant with a little boy who was named Jonathan David. And he was all boy. He never showed any interest in music. He just loved to play sports. I don't care if it was a ball, he was into it. But at 19 years of age, graduating from high school, he came in my room one night and he said, Daddy, didn't you used to play guitar? See, we never told him the whole thing. We told him, God healed your mommy, we had a baby. We didn't tell him what he was gonna be doing with her. Because did you used to play guitar? Can you teach me some chords? And so we sent him off to Nuneaton YWAM in England with a guitar and a Bible. I came to visit him in November. And on the last night before we were returning home, some of the kids said, you should hear some of Jonathan's worship. I said, Jonathan, I got a little cassette replay and I know your sisters love to hear you. You're playing guitar better. He said, yeah, play a song, Daddy. And he played the song and I went, oh my gosh, who wrote that? He said to me now, he says, I'll never forget the look on your face because you had waited 19, well really 20 years for a word of a prophet to become reality. We will dance in your palace all our days. We'll sing in your temple with all our praise. We'll shout down the walls in the name of your son because we will overcome. We will overcome. I said, Jonathan, you wrote that. I said, the first song you wrote is the, prof the prophecy of your entire life. My generation, the 60s, the hippies, we threw away our inheritance. We wasted what God gave us as your generation to take back what my generation destroyed. You're going to take back the land and you're going to do it through the power of worship. And so it is that here I am 71 years old, and it used to be, oh, Jonathan David, Ken Helser's your daddy. <laughs> no more. You're Jonathan David's daddy? Oh, that can't be. I just say, I'm no longer slave to fear. I am a child of God.
Isn't that good? You get the feeling like a lot of people are going to be going to download and Jonathan David Hilser is in Really a great songwriter, wonderful, wonderful worship. I encourage you to do so. So last thing, I'll close with this. Um, we were at a conference a couple weeks ago, which we're going to be going back to next year. Uh, the Global Leadership Conference is hosted by Willow Creek Church. And uh, boy, I gained a really a new love and respect for Pastor Bill Hybels. Uh, didn't really, I knew who he was and know about their ministry. I mean, they're a mega church and what a wonderful man of God. And we're going to be taking our ministry teams there next year uh, to the Global Leadership Conference. But there was something a gentleman said that, you know, I've heard people say before, but it really impacted me. And uh, just such a simple statement, but so profound that anything worth having in life is uphill. Anything worth having, anything worth doing, it's going to be a fight. And don't get me wrong, I understand the grace of God and, and, and works and their place, but if you're a business person, you understand that. You know how much of a, and we're talking about a good fight. The Bible says fight the good fight of faith. We're not talking about a bad fight, not putting out fires all the time, you know, not the negative stuff, but it's a good fight. But it is an uphill slide, you know, so to speak. And so anything worth having to be a good dad, to be a good husband, is, it doesn't just happen. You got to make choices. You've got to bow your will to God's will. You've got to make the hard choices sometimes that are unselfish. To be a good husband, you've got to make those unselfish choices. And they're not always the easy ones to make, but they're the right ones to make. If you've ever been around ministry, man, Dean Randy could get up here and talk about this for weeks, you know, the, the, the challenges, but the victories are so sweet, you know, and we always win in Christ, but it's not always an easy journey. You got to work for it. Ask the Whittinghams. Does it just happen that they give out groceries and food every week and you know and, and clothes? No, it's a lot of work. It, it's it's a it's a lot of work. It's uphill all the way. All the volunteers that come in are a blessing to them. Yeah, you know what I'm talking about. So we can't forget that that there's going to be challenges that come, like this video. You know, there's there's challenges that came. They could have gave up. They could have you know went with the hysterectomy. She could have lived out the rest of her days. No more children. Went to heaven. But without hearing from God and without obeying the Holy Spirit and saying, okay, God, if this is your promise, this is what you're saying, we're going to do this, we wouldn't enjoy the benefit of someone who's a blessing to the body of Christ, this young man who grew up to be a psalmist. So don't underestimate the choices that you make every day and the fruit they're going to produce because every one of them are critical because you're a child of God. And the choices you make are impacting the world, whether they seem significant or not. Every choice you make, and it's not to put a heaviness on you, just make the good ones. There's mercy to cover the ones you must have a mistake in, but make the good ones and know that every choice you make are going to impact the kingdom of God. Amen? Hallelujah. Let's all stand together. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We thank you for speaking this morning. Father, for speaking to me. God, for speaking to hearts. Lord, we understand that this whole idea of destiny and destination and purpose is something that you put in us, you put in the earth. And we understand that the choices that we make are critical, especially, Father, when we figure out it's really not about us and our own selfishness, our own world, the things that we spend money on, the things that we spend time with. Lord, if there are things that you've called us to do, it's, Lord, we understand it's not that you don't want us to recreate and enjoy things. Yes, that's part of it. But in the bigger picture, God, how are we spending our resources, our time, our energy, our thoughts, the things that we attach our affections to when it comes to changing the world? All of us can do so because changing the world starts with one person. It doesn't start with having to change the entire earth. It starts with changing one, our neighbors, our family members that we pour ourselves into, our children, our fellow brothers and sisters right here in this church and in the body of Christ in large. Father, we thank you that all of us can do something. And I, I know without a doubt, God, that there's people who something's hit them in their spirit about some, just some adjustments they need to make. That they could be better on this path or to hit another gear, God, or, or just keep running. There are people I know that are just running towards their destination. It'd be hard for us to keep up with them, but just encourage them to keep running, keep going. Oh, God, it's a good race. We keep our eyes on the prize, and we're running just full blaze, God, for you. It's never a chore. If it is, we're doing something wrong. We can rest in you. We can find comfort in you. This, this journey is meant to be enjoyed along the way. 
Father, we thank you for the mountaintop experiences. But Lord, we even know that those who climb mountains at the summit, at the pinnacle, it's, it's a temporary existence. They may plant a flag. They may take a picture. They may enjoy it there. But then they go back down. The real joy and the challenge is in the climb. It's in the climb up and it's in the descent on to the next one. So we thank you for those moments of greatness and victory. But Father, they don't define our lives. All they do is enhance it. So even those who've had some victories in their life and they may feel like they've done it, Father, speak to them that they would take on something new and run. Lord, I think about Miss Rose and Miss Naughty and these ones that are, they're in their 90s and they have fresh vision and they're running with it and, and doing great exploits for the kingdom and not backing down. Miss Rose just telling me recently about it, excited to get back to the Philippines. She's 96, my Lord, and just excited about the vision you've put in her. Huh. Well, thank you for that example of understanding purpose and destiny. Help us to get to that place, Father. We place a premium on getting to our destination. Yes, we go through this life. Father, we understand that that's the priority. Show us, everyone, what we need to do to get to that place in Jesus' name. Hallelujah.